welcome. Um, my name is Ayaka and I am a consultant with LSAT Unplugged. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have, we're, I'm super excited. We have um, Loretto Coloma Jr. from um, the University of Hawaii at Manoa, William S. Richardson School of Law. Um, of Law. Um, and he is the acting director of admissions there. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm super excited to do this interview. Um, and first, let me hand the mic over to you so you can do a little bit of an intro for yourself and then we'll get into the questions. Thank you for having me and good morning and um, good, good afternoon for you folks on the time, uh, different time zone. That is kind of one of the things about being in Hawaii is making sure we can connect with folks um, when the time is good for them. And so it's wonderful to have this opportunity um, to join you folks to talk about the William S. Richardson School of Law, Hawaii's only law school, and uh, one that we hope serves the state and the Pacific. Perfect. Wow. And, uh, you know, clearly you have the, the picture of the school behind you as your background. Um, beautiful skies, beautiful campus, obviously. Um, I just wanted to get right into the questions. You know, a lot of students, when they are starting to look at law schools, they think about, you know, the prestige and all that, um, you know, there's always that list of top schools to go to. Um, but then beyond that, there's a lot of other considerations that, you know, go into choosing a law school. And, and one thing I would like to ask you is, what kind of student is a right fit for, you know, someone who wants to go to the William S. Richardson School of Law? Um, you know, you can tackle this from a couple different perspectives. Uh, one being, you know, you want to go to law school in the area you'd hopefully like to practice in the future. And so for many folks who want to practice in Hawaii in the future, it is a good bet to go to Hawaii's law school, in particular for the networking opportunities and the strengths that we have in terms of, you know, certificate programs. It definitely lines up with the type of work that one might do in Hawaii in the future. So including native Hawaiian law, environmental law international law and Pacific Asian law. And so um, to that extent, one can figure out maybe Hawaii's law school is for me and that's the great fit. Um, the other would be, you know, we have a small, um, we're a small law school. And so students who thrive in that environment and um, who bring that diversity to the classroom, I think those students would be a great fit in terms of um, the collaboration that we bring all together. Um, that's kind of one of the, of the anecdotal things about the students in our community is that they all help one another. Um, there, the, there's competition there in terms of a rigorous uh, learning environment, but also there is that collaboration to, you know, get everyone to the finish line. And I think students who can fit into that um, have the interest in our um, strength areas and will help their fellow student. I think they would be that right fit and they would definitely thrive in this environment. Wow. Okay. And in terms of applicant makeup, um, is it a lot of local students who are applying or are there a majority of students applying? Are they from the mainland? What's that makeup look like? Um, at the end of the day, when we break down the numbers, most of our applicants are out of state. Mm -hmm. And particularly, we just also have a small um, application pool from Hawaii itself. So, mm -hmm. you know, there are probably um, a, a few hundred students from Hawaii applying to any law school at any time. And then our applications are, you know, nearly 800 in this last year. And so at the end of the day, um, most folks applying are not um, from the University of Hawaii or from Hawaii in general. Um, but also when it comes down to kind of picking and choosing the school at the end of the day, um, most folks from Hawaii are the ones um, attending Hawaii's law school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for various factors of, from financing to, you know, it's really far away from home for folks. And so um, factoring that in and their own support networks, I think that at the end of the day comes down to about 80% of students having um, been from Hawaii or are from Hawaii or have strong ties to the state. And mm -hmm. the other 20 or so percent um, being folks from um, the mainland as well as internationally. Great. That's great to know. Um, it kind of delving into like the application process. Um, when you look at an applicant, 
um, in their application. What is your process of looking at that? Like, are you looking at the scores first, the GPA first, the, the mm -hmm. essays first? What, what are you looking at? So it's, it's no secret, and it's on our website on how the admissions committee kind of breaks down and looks each at, at each application. So I'm going to do my best to quote that almost the same because it's it's not a particular secret in that um, when we have, a, we have a rolling admissions process, so as applications come in, they're reviewed, and then the admissions committee will look at them in different thirds. And so that first third being the test score, whether it's the LSAT or the GRE, and we accept both with no particular preference. Um, that next third would be the academic record. And other than focusing just on the GPA itself, the admissions committee will do their best to give the student the benefit of looking at any positive trends or did they have you know, a better last few semesters and can they give them the benefit of being a strong student um, entering law school than maybe they were starting off in college. Mm -hmm. um, and particular for folks who may, might have been a bit of time since they've been um, in school, you know, they'll consider the professional accolades and things like that. And then that last third would be kind of the everything else. They'll look at the resume, they'll look at the personal statement, they'll consider the letters of recommendation, um, any addenda that are provided to give context to any other parts of the application. And those are, and including, you know, your ties to the state. Um, in particular, being the only law school in the state of Hawaii and in the Pacific, we do have um, this responsibility to kind of look out for those folks. And so um, while there is a preference for folks from Hawaii, it does not exclude anyone um, from applying. And at, as like we mentioned earlier, you know, most of our applicants are out of state. And at the end of the day, most of our applicants admitted will also be out of state. But at the end of the day, for many different factors, um, we still have a makeup that are mostly folks from Hawaii. Great. So I, I do kind of want to go into the application process a little bit in, in the thirds that you were talking about. So the first mm -hmm. third, the, the testing scores. Um, you know, we are LSAT unplugged here, so we're very focused on the LSAT. Yes. Um, a lot of students have the question of how does admissions look at multiple scores, um, mm -hmm. you know, two, three plus scores, what, what kind of impression do you have of a student with that? Sure. So when you have multiple scores, the admissions committee will look at your highest score when considering um, your decision. Um, they'll also see all of your other scores. Ideally, you'd want to um, take it once and be done. And, you know, it's cheaper in that process, right? Yeah. But if you have multiple scores and, you know, if there have been significant differences in the scores, particularly if there might be um, a drop in the latest one, one might provide an addendum to give context to that. And I think that's kind of one of the strengths of our admissions committee is that um, they'll take in all the information they can to, you know, really make a broader decision rather mm -hmm. than um, relying solely on, on that one um, numerical indicator. So um, you get the benefit of the highest score and also a chance to explain if there are any discrepancies that need to be explained. Great, great. And then going into that academic record, um, you get students um, who you know have done very well in school and maybe have gotten a, a B minus in one class and they're like, do I need to write an addendum for one class? Um, mm -hmm. You, you know, uh, what is what is your thoughts on that? That that could be a kind of on a case by case for each student to consider, um, depending on the class. You know, um, I would say if it was you know a particular circumstance outside of their control that they really feel strongly about, I say you know write a quick addendum to explain what might have happened, and it could have just been some thing out of their control and. I'd rather they be able to explain that than try to hope that the rest of the application makes up for it. I think at the end of the day, we don't have you know interviews with the students. And mm -hmm. the idea of trying to mitigate any questions that the admissions committee has is really something to think about. And so if they need to, and they feel strongly about it, I suggest they write an addendum. But at the end of the day, you know, if they have strong grades overall, it may or may not be necessary to do so. Got it. And um, 
in the last year, we got, we got this question a lot. Um, students who, you know, we've all been through COVID and it, it's been a tough time for everybody and, you know, school going virtual, students might have turned their grades from letter grades to pass fail, or they've dropped a couple classes in the middle of the semester. Um, is there an explanation, like a very, you know, a big explanation needed um, in their application to explain those things, especially in the spring of 2020 or fall of 2020, um, where their their transcript may look different than other semesters um, overall? You know, I don't think there is a particular need to do so, um, unless it may have impacted them in a particular way. I, I say our admissions committee is really good about thinking of you know what might have been happening and they'll see the trends i think eventually with most applicants having um different grade styles in that spring in particular and so i'm um, keeping that in mind um it probably isn't necessary to really need an addendum but mm -hmm. you know if there are other things going on sure. um that they need to address then you know uh, the addendum is a great place to talk about it if you know they're still wondering, do do I need to write about it? We can always talk with them um, in our admissions office. We're, we're glad to just kind of feel out the situation to help them kind of put their best foot forward with the admissions committee. Got it. I mean, that's that's wonderful that you know students can come to admissions to really talk about that. Um, and, and then you mentioned this a little bit. Students who have been out of school for a, a couple years to many years, um, you know, how does the school kind of, a, you know, see those students? Are they good for your school? Not good? You know, how, how what's the view there? So um, what they bring to the classroom other than, you know, um, strong academic work would be also their professional work ethic, you know, having done well in their careers before attending law school, um, they bring that discipline and that focus, but also the expertise they have in their fields, that brings in a level of diversity that um, would be really difficult to maybe have received in undergrad um, if you're going straight through undergrad to law school. And so we do appreciate having those students to really give a, a realistic um, viewpoint of things when a professor is talking about case law and things like that and you know this is how it works in, in the um in the um out in the world and they they can really speak up and say actually that with a little caveat that is not exactly how it works but you know they they really add to the discussion there and i think um that is really helpful just for the other students as a learning opportunity and so we see them as positive and i think uh the in that in between time, you know, as long as they've been productive and um, they get the references they need, I think it's all a win-win situation for them to, in some cases, finally return to law school and um, get the law degree they've always wanted to. Great, that's great news. Um, and, you know, when uh, the, those people who have been out of school for a bit, they write their resume, they, they're usually, in the kind of practice of writing a, a resume f when they're looking for a job. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us what you would look for in a resume that's going to a law school? Um, what kind of things should people hit on? Um, are there particular accolades that should be in there? Um, anything like that? Uh, we have no specific um, guideline on the resume, but I think, um, in the sense that you want to use this piece along with all of your other pieces to make sure that um, you give enough information about yourself to be evaluated by the admissions committee, given no other information otherwise comes in. You know, the resume really has its place to fill in um, those kind of gaps. And so while you might have your supervisor write a particular letter about how you are as an employee and all of those things, um, it's really a chance for you, almost kind of like a personal statement to really advocate for yourself and um, what you've done in, in your particular role at each of those places, but also just to see that you've been um, productive doing things um, over the years. And, you know, if there are gaps in the resume, then um, because some things don't necessarily fit in the resume, but take up our time, right, yeah. then um, the addendum, again, um, really comes into place to really help fill in those gaps. But sure. um, nothing in particular other than um, making sure that they advocate for themselves to be sure that the admissions committee knows 
um, their other successes outside of um, all of the other things they're probably already doing, sure. um, whether it's in the community, but also in their workplace. Great. And I, you touched about on it a little bit, the personal statement. Um, and I know there's a couple of essays out there um, that you can write for app in your application, but the personal statement being the biggest, um, how important is it to, you know, take time and, and write a good one that is representative of yourself? That That's a really, really important piece of the application. I would say it's one of the pieces that really helps you tell your story. And at the end of the day, everyone has a unique story to tell. And this is your chance to really focus in on, you know, why you and why law school. And so, you know, we have... Uh, a new a new ish section that we split out where they can tell us you know why do you want to attend Richardson and so that hopefully gives them a bit more room to write in the personal statement to actually keep on target of you know why themselves why law school um, and not necessarily have to tie in about writing to Richardson in that piece and so we do have a short personal statement of 500 words and really sticking to that amount of space is, is sort of an art. You know, it's a small amount of space, but um, students can do it successfully and mm -hmm. um, really bring their story out. And I think that's um, kind of one of the big pieces in that last one third, as we were talking about, that really helps students um, communicate with the admissions committee about, you know, why they should be admitted. Great. Yeah, uh, clearly an important piece. And it's great that you kind of pulled out that why um, William S. Richardson School of Law, because sometimes people try to mesh it in and it, mm -hmm. it gets too big. So um, I think that's great and, and gives students a little bit more room. Um, that's, this is great information. Um, one last thing about the admissions process. Um, has anything changed due to the pandemic? Um, it, you know, last year was kind of, everything was in flux, but as we are kind of, well, not really, but trying to taper out of the pandemic, um, what has changed about the admissions process? You know, I would say, as a small law school um, and just being in Hawaii in general, a lot of that kind of in-person contact and really being around people has been sort of a big thing about how we connect with our prospective students. And going online has been kind of that change in terms of connecting with prospective applicants, but also been a good thing for some folks who otherwise don't have the funds to travel to Hawaii or happen to be in the area during the admission cycle. And so um, really connecting with folks um, virtually has been one of those changes in terms of admissions and even connecting with them through entering law school. So in this past summer, as you know, our students were um, being oriented to law school and all the different activities they do over the summer, a lot of it has been virtual. And so it's been it's not the same, I would say, compared to um, how we've had it in years previous and really getting to meet and speak with one another. But it's um, it's still been a way for us to still connect despite all that's going on. Great, great. And, and moving on to kind of, you know, what it's like to be a law student at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Um, it, there's a lot of schools out there that have like prep programs or recommend prep programs before their first year. Um, what can students do to be prepared for this 1L year at, at, at the law school? So at the law school, um, we've started an, a new program um, with Barbary. Uh, so that's the, in this past summer, they've um, started this one course that they would take um, to sort of prep them to dive hit, um, dive in on the first day. Um, and, and I know there are a few other opportunities down the line that the administration's working to have over the summer, but also during the summer, we want to have the students connect with um, their fellow students, uh, the upperclassmen, to really uh, get to know a bit more about the campus and about uh, the teaching styles of their professors, kind of what to expect. So in that sense, Aside from the Barbie learning that is relatively new, um, the summer, a lot of folks are just connecting with their peers to make sure that 
when they get into law school, they, they have those connections moving forward to make sure that they're successful. And I think as one of the smaller law schools, um, you do get to know almost everyone in your class. And so, um, you know, the full-time class being about 90 students, that is sometimes a lot smaller than a lot of graduating high school classes. So, yeah. And, you know, being prepared and feeling a little bit more prepared that that probably builds up the confidence of the student a little bit more. Um, and what can a student expect in their first year um, at the School of Law? So um, at Richardson, I think their, the expectation for their first year would be their schedules are, you know, Monday through Thursday. So they'll have Fridays to either catch up and or if their makeup days needed. Um, at the end of the day, sometimes those days are needed. We A few years ago, you know, we had a hurricane come by and we had to close off for a couple of days and the Fridays were there to really help um, students and their classes catch up. Um, so that schedule wise, that's one thing to expect. Um, in terms of, you know, just being in Hawaii in general, the getting to know, I would say, uh, one another and their faculty, that is something that will happen starting at orientation in day one. They, they will be immersed into the community right away. And so they'll meet everyone from their fellow classmates all the way up to the chief justice. Um, and that's just, you know, with the Wednesday of orientation by that day. And so really getting them immersed into the legal community, I think that is one of the things that they can expect coming in to Richardson. Um, another thing that they probably would be starting to do is, aside from their doctrinal classes, they'll be working with our um, professional development folks to really get a grasp on during their second and third years, being ready to be either uh, meet with prospective employers or you know, get the information they need to decide on what types of law they're interested in, as well as um, meet with clinical faculty. And for a particularly small school, I would say we have a robust offering of um, clinics and simulations and um, externships. And so I think all of that, they'll have a chance to really see everything um, when they get in. And for students who are like super interested in one particular clinic or one particular externship, how do they go about doing that? Um, is that something that starts on their, you know, during their first year or is it something that they do in between their first year and second year? Like where does that timeline hit? Um, so I would say sometime in their first year, it'll happen. They can target a particular clinic if they'd like and get to know the professor. We, our, our faculty is, is relatively, um, open to meeting with students at all levels and um, really getting on the radar for it. At the end of the day, from our clinical faculty, what we've heard is that um, most students will have a chance to get the clinic of their choice either in their second or third year. Mm -hmm. And so as early as the summer between their first and second year, students will be um, probably starting their clinical or simulations or externships. And mm -hmm. so um, if not by the spring of that first year, um, they will be, you know, looking and choosing what, um, I guess, clinical opportunities are available. Great. And I, and I know you mentioned simulations. I've heard clinics and externships from other schools as well, but could you kind of give an explanation around what a simulation is at, at the school? Sure. So um, aside from clinics and working more directly with, um, clients in person. Simulations are in many ways with a practicing, um, a practicing lawyer who comes in and they'll, they'll do role playing in, in that particular setting. And so being the, the only law school again in the state, we do have many alumni as well as um, practicing lawyers in downtown, which is really close by who will come in and help um, provide their expertise to the students. And so um, rather than from just a from the book standpoint, you have someone who is in that position, who is doing it on a daily basis, um, teaching the students. And oftentimes it's, you know, right after their workday in, in that evening session where they can provide that expertise. So simulation in, in that role playing sense. Great. That, that's amazing. And, and I love that, you know, you're kind of the school is also has and has a thriving network. 
of students who graduated out of school. Um, it and are students able to take advantage of that network while they're in law school as well? Yes, and so um, once they are graduated or while they're in law school, I know we have um, an alumni association where students join in, but also um, newly graduated alumni, they, they're really eager to really connect with students. And so um, even during the pandemic, we've had uh, one of our, our uh, alumni, they've come back and did you know these fireside chats with students so they introduce themselves as early as to our admitted students you know who have not even entered law school to say hey you know if you want to come and chat about things um here's a zoom link come and chat mm -hmm. um and so other you know as far as those students all the way through current students um there is a uh re a revival of this network to to really be more robust and really build those connections um, even deeper. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And that's amazing that, you know, that's thriving so well. Um, you mentioned a couple, you know, a couple points ago about, you know, some interesting areas of study um, that might not be um, available at other schools. Um, could you delve a little bit deeper into, I know you said um, Native Hawaiian um, law and also environmental law. Um, kind of go deeper into that? Absolutely. So um, those are our strength areas and we have dedicated faculty for each of those programs and for which we have also have certificates. And so um, the Native Hawaiian Law Program is the only one of its kind in the country. And in many ways, students who are interested in indigenous law as well, really find the parallels that they can take into kind of their future endeavors with them. And so we'll have students um, interested in Indigenous law, as well as Native Hawaiian law, um, taking those courses in particular. Um, environmental law, we're um, fortunate to have a ranked environmental law program, and our faculty have been involved from um, local goings on with the environment all the way through, you know, um, the IUCN. And so we've had faculty kind of working with folks across the world as they um, are they're experts in their own field. And uh, one of our professors was uh, recently appointed by the administration to go work on things on the federal level. So um, that expertise that our students get in the classroom is very uh, great, but also it's also tied very closely with our Native Hawaiian law classes. And um, they're a bit overlap in terms of the values of um, Native Hawaiian values and valuing the environment. So um, those are kind of our strength areas that are almost synergistic in some senses. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have international law and Pacific Asian law. Um, for the most part, it is Asia focused just because of where we are. And so a lot of our visiting professors, as well as a lot of our international students will come from um, Asia in particular. And so our LLM students, as well as our advanced JD students, um, all bring that to the classroom, uh, having worked in their, their respective places uh, in Asia. Mm. And so those are kind of the big pieces of where expertise lies. And uh, we hope as uh, over the next few years to see um, other, play, other types of law in particular um, evolve within our faculty. Right, and that's amazing. Um, and, and I love that there's some unique pieces um, that are, you know, part of the the, um, the school's expertise. I'm, I'm wondering, and I'm ping-ponging back to the applicant a little bit, but um, as an applicant, is it necessary to show some interest in one of those areas of law, um, or is it okay for an applicant to say, I'm just interested in the law and apply to that school? It's, um, you, it's not a requirement to um, have an interest in one of those particular programs. And some students uh, are, and many times um, students will come in with a particular focus and totally mm -hmm. change their mind just after they've kind of seen it all. And so we don't fault them in particular for not having a particular type of law in mind. And if it doesn't match ours in particular, it's great if they have that as well, um, just to kind of build that fit with us, but it's, it's not necessary. And I think at the end of the day, that represents, you know, maybe half of the folks 
have a particular interest, maybe in our environmental or native Hawaiian law or international law, but the other half just want to study law in general, whether it's um, criminal law or other. And so it's not a requirement. It's, it can be helpful, but it's, I, and the, at the end of the day, I say uh, being truthful about, you know, the type of law that you'd like and what you'd like to do will also help them decide, you know, um, is Richardson a place that I actually want to apply to in particular if, you know, their interests align um, with better with another school then that might be the school they want to go to. And it feels weird for me to say, go to apply to another school. But I think at the end of the day, we want the students to, you know, find a place that they'll thrive and go to it. And if Richardson is that place, then we'll definitely welcome them. Sure, that's, that's amazing. Um, and as a student body and someone who, you know, wants to join that student body, what kind of attitude should a student have going into law school um, and, and kind of being part of that community? I think something that they need to think about going to law school is that, um, as our pre-law advisors said in a session recently, it's kind of that big fish in, in a big pond mentality now. You know, they've uh, done really well in their undergrad and um, they're a thriving scholar and now they're amongst other scholars. And so not to feel that, you know, they are inadequate in any way because they've gotten into law school. You know, we believe that they can do well in law school, and I think they should bring that with them um, to know that they can do it and work with one another to really be successful um, in their law studies. Perfect. Um, last question for you. What is your favorite thing about the school? Um, and it's pretty open, so. Goodness, if you mean I have to pick one thing, I would say, um, if I had to pick just one thing, and it's kind of not a one thing, but I would say all of the faculty and, and the staff, I think hands down without them and kind of the support they give to all the students um, down to all the our custodial staff as well as all our lecturers. I think that support is something that's really hard to get in terms of, you know, you can't, you can't trade it out for a, a nicer facility door. It's kind of that person helping you out along in the process. I think that people capital is something that we have a lot to give. And I hope that our, our students feel that as well in terms of um, being welcomed and having the resources they need to really find what they like to do in law and after law school. Wow, that's I mean, I would love to go down your list of all the favorite things you have about the school. Um, but um, you know, this has been an amazing conversation. It sounds like students, if they have any questions about the application process or admissions or about the law school, they could reach out to um, admissions, correct? Yes, and we have several Zoom sessions um, throughout the fall. I think we have seven or eight of them. We'll be at all of the LSAC digital forums. So we look forward, in, uh, look forward to connecting with folks. Um, in the different ways they can. And virtual has been really helpful for us to reach folks that otherwise would not have ever seen themselves as far as Hawaii um, in person to otherwise come to a session. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, it was wonderful um, and, and having my questions answered. So thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Um, and thank you all for listening. Um, and we hope that if you have any questions, please do reach out um, to admissions. Um, we'll have the, uh, well, hopefully an email link um, at the in the description box of the YouTube um, video or the podcast. Um, so you can reach out anytime. Um, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, that was very quick, um, but you know, we went through the questions very quick, but thank you so much, this has been wonderful. Oh, th thank you for um, allowing us to even just do this exchange later on. I know the uh, director of admissions is transitioning out at the same time as your um, other uh, scheduled mm -hmm. session. So yeah. thanks for still having us on. And, um, no problem. And just so you know, this is our uh, campus center courtyard, not necessarily the law school and- um, oh. the, Right behind me, that building is our new rec center from a few years ago. So wow. students do have the opportunity to, it's right across the street from the law school. 
Oh, okay. But if you're interested to see the law school, um, let me just pop one up real quick. Um, this would otherwise be kind of our law school main building. Oh, oh my gosh. It's very so, stately. <laughs> outdoor campus. It's for the most part, it doesn't rain. So I think that would probably have been the second closest thing to my favorite thing is that the mm -hmm. weather is great almost all year <laughs> round and um, conducive to learning almost in and outside of the classroom, I think. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. Um, and, and this has been very helpful. And I know there's students that are interested out there. So absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.